Good morning. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, for those of you who know me, you know that I have a tendency to speak fairly quickly. I'm going to speak even faster because you want to uh, hear from the presenters and not from me. Um, over the years, we at Pear Tree have sponsored many seminars in the both in the resource and philanthropic sectors. In recent years, as many as 300 participants have signed up. For this topic, we have seen well over 600 registrants, obviously a topic of great concern to a great number of people. We're fortunate to have a stellar panel with us this morning. Each panelist will present a short series of slides that will take us out for no more than about a half an hour, followed by a panel discussion for the balance of the time. Um, many, um, uh, many registrants have already sent in questions. If you have any questions during the presentation, by all means, send them in and we'll try to answer as many as we can in real time. Uh, the seminar is being recorded and there will be a link provided within a week or so. We are also providing English and French subtitles and as well be providing written responses to as many questions as we can within a reasonable period of time. Um, these, uh, before introducing the panelists, uh, I've been asked to provide a short explanation of what is alternate minimum tax, uh, otherwise known as AMT. And the best way to explain AMT, especially in today's environment, is by explaining its genesis. Uh, tax policy is often not driven by evidence, it's driven by emotion. In 1986, Stanley Hart, who had been a partner at the law firm in Montreal of Steichman Elliott, uh, was recruited by the then Prime Minister Mulroney to be the Deputy Minister of Finance, uh, which a position he held for a couple of years before becoming uh, the Chief of Staff for the Prime Minister. Prime Minister Mulroney regularly referred to Stanley as uh, the smartest person he ever met. Sadly, Stanley died about five years ago. He was a very good friend and meant very much part of the Perry family for the five or six years before he died. One of Stanley's law partners in Montreal prior to 1986 was Sonny Gordon, also now dead. And this is a story that is well known in Montreal, so I'm not telling anything out of school. But Sonny always boasted that he never paid tax. And the Income Tax Act of Canada has always promoted tax incentive investments. Best example are flow through shares. Or in the 1980s, the tax shelter of choice would have been an investment in the film industry. So prior to 1986, a taxpayer could drive his or her taxable income to zero and not pay a dime in tax. Stanley was offended. He thought it was inappropriate, thought it was unfair that he and Sonny were making about the same amount of money and that Stanley was paying his fair share. So when he became Deputy Minister of Finance, uh, Stanley introduced AMT. It's a, actually a U.S. Uh, rule, which, uh, for example, which basically provides an alternative way of calculating your tax. Um, and so, for example, taking an easy, simple example, if you're making a million dollars a year, uh, you're going to pay $250,000 in tax, no matter how many deductions and credits you otherwise have, with the balance then carried forward uh, for seven years which makes AMT often referred to as a timing issue. It isn't, you know, what if, what if you die in year two or you never have as much income in the subsequent years to use it all up? So more often than not, although characterized as timing, it is often not timing, it's actually absolute. Um, um, one last data point before introducing uh, the panelists. The seminar was initially visioned as an instructional for the philanthropic community, and it still is. That said, many folks in the resource sector reached out and we expanded the invitation list. All the deductions about AMT and capital gains is of particular importance to the resource sector, especially those raising funds through the issuance of flow through shares. Very briefly, when a flow through share is bought for a dollar, the subscriber deducts a dollar for tax purposes, but it's as if he or she paid nothing. The cost base is nil. And if the share is then sold even years later for say 30 or 35 cents, which is very common, there's still a capital gain of 30 or 35 cents, even though there's an economic loss, even, even an after-tax economic loss. Thus, all capital gains discussion you will learn about shortly uh, has material impact on the resource sector. Moreover, when combining uh, uh, flow-through share donations, the, 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 that overlap uh, gets multiplied even greater. Um, we hope to address some of these issues during the panel discussion, otherwise in writing within a week or two, uh, or email me. Contact information is on our website under my bio. Uh, one caution, before you consider becoming a tax refugee and moving to Cayman or Barbados, the 2023 budget proposals are not law. The implementation is said to be in 2024, but absent public pushback, 
It may very well become law under this government and thus the need for seminars such as these and the hope that folks will engage with government. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later uh, in the presentation. We have three presenters with us this morning. If I were to list all their accomplishments, academic papers, awards, we need another half an hour. All are chartered accountants, all are well-versed in tax. From Vancouver, British Columbia, Hugh Woolley. Hugh is a chartered accountant uh, by profession, holds the TEP designation as an expert in trusts and estate planning. Early on worked at CRA, the Canada Revenue Agency in its rulings branch, and has authored numerous papers for the Canadian Tax Foundation. You will, providing, will be providing an AMT overview highlights and then hand the discussion over to Ali Spinner here in Toronto. Uh, Ali is a partner in the CA firm of Crow Soberman, where she is, uh, where she's the leader of the high net worth tax practice. Ali is also a uh, trust and state planning uh, uh, TEP uh, designation, has that de designation, and in 2022 was elected as a fellow of the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. That's a big deal. She regularly lectures at the Rotman School of Management and is active in many charitable organizations where she provides lay leadership and professional advisory. The last presenter is Robert Bobby, the Oracle Kleinman in Montreal. Bobby is also a chartered accountant and has written the book on how to give more to charity for less after tax for, and for the better part of two decades as its executive director through the Montreal Jewish Community Foundation from about $100 million under administration to now over $2 billion serving constituents largely across Quebec and across all cultural and religious groups. And with that, I'd like to turn the, the, the mic and podium over to Hugh Woolley in Vancouver. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you very much, Ron, and uh, good morning from uh, the heat wave in sunny Vancouver. Um, commencing in uh, 2024, there are two major changes to AMT that will impact charitable giving. Uh, first, 50% of non-refundable credits, which includes the donation tax credit, will no longer reduce AMT payable. Okay, it's for, by way of example, currently a $1 million cash gift reduces federal and British Columbia tax by $535,000, which implies a 53.5% top marginal tax rate, which is very similar to the rates in Ontario, Quebec, and uh, several other provinces. Uh, commencing in uh, 2024, uh, the AMT will only be reduced by half of this amount, or $267,500. Uh, this will drastically increase the odds that AMT will apply. Uh, second, 30% uh, of the non-tax gift of marketable securities will be added to the AMT income base, again, significantly increasing the odds that AMT will apply. Uh, next slide, please. Um, other major uh, proposed changes to AMT commencing in 2024. One, 100% uh, up from the current 80% of capital gains will be included in the, in the AMT income base. Two, 100% up from 50% of qualifying stock options will be included in the AMT income base. And by a qualifying stock option, I mean a stock option that qualifies for the 50% reduction. And there are two different ways that uh, uh, you know, a stock can qualify. Uh, the most common and publicly traded uh, stock is if the uh, option was granted at fair market value, if the strike price was fair market value when it was originally uh, 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 issued. Uh, three, only 50% of many expenses this will include things like interest expense uh, and uh, loss carry forward balances, both capital and non-capital, uh, will be deductible in computing the AMT base. Uh, again, this is a, a major game changer. Um, four, uh, the AMT tax rate will increase from 15% to 20.5%. And finally, on the positive side, uh, AMT, uh, exemption will increase from 40,000 to 173. This will take a lot of uh, lower income individuals out of the AMT, uh, AMT regime, uh, but for higher uh, net worth individuals, it will not make any material difference. Um, going on uh, to look at the, um, the uh, impact, uh, uh, particularly on tax rates in the capital gains exemption. 
Uh, the top marginal uh, tax rate federally, and I'm not going to talk about provinces because each province uh, is slightly different in its rate and it, its application of AMT. Um, the top marginal, um, top federal marginal rate for capital gain is 50%, uh, the inclusion rate. This means that a capital gain is effectively taxed at 50% of 33% or 16.5%. Uh, this amount is currently... Um, greater than the AMT rate of 15% uh, as it applies in 2023 and earlier years, but it is less than the proposed AMT rate of 20.5%. Uh, this is very important to note. This 4% increase, which is really 24% higher uh, from a, an absolute perspective, uh, increases the federal capital gain inclusion rate um, from its current 50% to approximately 62%, which is about 24% higher than 50%. And uh, this is really a backdoor stealth increase in the capital gain inclusion rate. I mean, a lot of people were concerned before the budget, will the government increase the capital gain inclusion rate, yes or no? Everyone said, gosh, they didn't do that. Well, that's not the case. This is effectively an increase in the capital gain inclusion rate, and many people, including most accountants, are completely unaware that that is the case. Um, uh, final slide. Uh, uh, AMT, as Ron mentioned, can be recovered for up to seven years to the extent that the regular tax payable in that subsequent year exceeds the AMT uh, for that subsequent year. Uh, and thus, it's possible that the extra tax paid will be refunded and that the stealth increase in the capital gain inclusion rate will effectively you know, be reduced back to close to 50%. Um, if the proceeds from the sale have been reinvested uh, and generate passive income, such as interest or something along those lines, then it's much more likely that you will be able to recover the AMT. However, if the assets are given away, uh, perhaps you give the assets to charity or you give the assets to your children, uh, or as Ron mentioned, the taxpayer does not live for seven more years, the extra tax paid may never be recovered. And in Ron's words, this will be an absolute increase in tax. Uh, that's, uh, uh, Ali, if you'd like to continue on. Excellent. Thank you so much. And just before I begin with my, my slides, I wanted to add one additional comment, um, Hugh, you, you indicated about, you talked about the ability to recover AMT that's been paid um, about the seven years. One other thing to keep in mind is that also if somebody departs Canada, if someone departs Canada and they have AMT or they have an AMT amount that they haven't recovered, they will obviously would not be able to recover that AMT once they're no longer a resident of Canada. Um, so thank you for, so much for that introduction that went over many of the technical, you know, the technical pieces that go into the calculation of AMT. I'm going to talk about um, AMT and the impact on philanthropy from a little bit of a different lens for a moment to frame the discussion as well. And really talk about this from the perspective of what I'm going to refer to as the high net worth donor, the person who is, is looking to make, um, you know, very meaningful donations from their wealth to, to the various charities that they wish to support. And in order to do that, I'd like to frame the discussion in, with the comments of, you know, philanthropy in Canada does allow for a distribution of wealth within society. Wealthy donors, of course, there are many donors who, who perhaps aren't wealthy. It doesn't really matter what I mean by that, but let's just go with the fact that wealthy donors, you know, look to self redistribute money to the charitable organizations that they are passionate about, depleting their wealth and increasing the wealth of society. Um, you know, in the next comment here, I said Canadians can actually allow the government to distribute the tax revenue that they raise, or Canadians can directly distribute the funds, their own funds, to the charitable organizations that they want to support. And I want to explain that comment. Of course, the government raises taxes. I'm not here to give an, an economic or academic paper on the raising of taxes, but the government raises taxes um, in various ways and distributes those taxes to the, you know, to the, the members of society that fall in accordance with their policies, plans, and objectives as they see fit. However, in the Canadian tax system, as a result of the, the charitable tax credit afforded to individuals, for example, um, individuals are able that rather if they take funds that have been taxed and let the government decide where the money goes, 
individuals are able to reduce the amount of tax that they pay on dollars and give dollars specifically to the organizations that they care about directly. So that's the government's way of saying, okay, if you, you know, if you have certain organizations that you care about and we have deemed them to be um, worthy of charitable, charitable status, you can give that money away directly and we will eliminate the amount of tax or reduce, I should say, the amount of tax on those dollars that you have given away. Now, one thing that I have found as an advisor in the high net worth community is that high net worth Canadians are, um, and importantly so, reliant on their tax advisors, on their advisors in general, to help provide them with guidance and advice around their, philo around their philanthropy. Um, and what I mean by that is that Although, although, you know, the panelists here, and I'm sure many people on this call are very adept at understanding how tax efficient gifts can be made, I do find still that the general public, including very wealthy Canadians, are not necessarily as savvy as they could or should be with respect to making tax efficient gifts. And I do see our role as advisors as the gatekeepers of this excellent information that we need to get across to, to our clients and the donors. Um, and the donors in our country to make sure that those gifts can be um, can be given in the most tax efficient way and provide education to the donors so that they can make their philanthropic choices in the most tax efficient way. Um, what I often talk about here is I, I oh just back to the slide before. Thanks. What I talk about in um, in the world um, in the world of AMT is that sorry in the world of, of, of giving a tax efficient philanthropy are what I refer to as three W's. Now the fourth W is the who you are giving to. That in some, you know, in some cases could be the most important, um, the most important W, but I'm not actually going to focus on that W. I'm going to focus on the what they are giving. So as advisors and as 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 um, representatives from charitable organizations, we work with donors to talk about are you giving cash? Are you giving public company stock with appreciated gains? Are you giving private company shares? Are you using flow through shares to magnify your donation dollars? Are you donating insurance? There's really no end to the things that you can actually give away. As well, we talk about where donors are giving it from. Um, we, we, it's always important, important to look back at the high net worth family and think about, are you giving it from your personal pocket? Are you gonna give it from an active business pocket? Uh, sorry, an active business corporation pocket, a passive business corporation pocket. So that's the where. Where does it make sense for this particular donor to give the donation from? And with these new AMT rules, that analysis and decision is going to become even more important because the, as, as we'll find out, the, the impact of the AMT on philanthropy may have a meaningful result on personal donations. And then of course, we talk about when they are giving it, the timing of when the donation is made. Um, as, a, as a tax planner, I always like to make sure that my client's philanthropy times, ties in timing-wise very closely with the timing of a liquidity event or years in which we're going to be paying lots and lots of tax to make sure that we can get um, as much as our tax-efficient dollars as we can from those donations. And I'll talk on the next slide of why that timing is so important to the philanthropic community. So if we can just go slide forward. So something that's important and maybe widely known or maybe not be widely known is that high net worth donors really do generally plan to make donations within AMT limits. I see the AMT limits, which have been around for many, many years as we discussed, but I see those AMT limits as guideposts or goalposts. Although it's true, AMT is often looked at as a temporary tax. It, it doesn't have to be a final tax if we can plan for it. I, I take the view, well, why would you want to pay it if you don't have to? You know, why, why would you want to have to prepay tax that you could receive in future years? So when, when clients and high net worth donors work together to, to make those gifts, we do look at those AMT limits. Well, how much of a donation could we make before those AMT goalposts kick in? And one thing that's very important is that Budget 2023 does propose to reduce various incentives for donations through changes to the AMT regime. And... So the comment here is that more funds will remain with the high net worth donors, I'll explain in a minute, but the impact of the changes is that those goalposts, when thinking about, well, how much can I donate before those AMT limits kick in, what will the effect be? If the goalposts were here, the goalposts are going to be much more narrow. It doesn't mean that a donation can't be made, but the quantum of donation that can be made may be changed if you're going to work within the AMT limits. And, and what that means, it dovetails into the third comment here, is that I still think that we will see the flow of funds to charities and people who want to be philanthropic, 
be philanthropic and give money away. However, I do expect that because of the narrowing of the goalposts, the timing, the, the timing, the flow of funds that we'll see, it is likely to slow. So whereas people want to give money away, they still may give away the same amount of money over their lifetime. But the, the flow, if they turn the tap on or off, if you think about it with their donations, they may slow down how quickly they give to make sure that they're within those goalposts. Um, one example I want to give as well is, you know, I do have some clients who are extremely philanthropic and have decided that they want to give away 98, 99% of their wealth in their lifetime, which is a beautiful thing. And whereas before, um, I should say in the rules, you know, up to the end of 2023, before these proposed new rules in, um, an individual could get, perhaps they're sitting on a portfolio of, of uh, appreciated public company stock. And the individual could give all of that money away and all of that money could go directly to charity. The AMT rules would not have kicked in because as we knew, um, the donation of public appreciated public company stock, for example, wasn't included at all within the AMT, within the AMT world. Now that individual they can still give away all of their money. However, where before all of their money was going to charity, now some of their money will go to charity. And because of the AMT rules, some of their money will go to the government not necessarily saying that people are anti-government or don't want the government to decide where the money goes, but certainly less money will go directly to the charities that the person wanted to support by having by getting caught up in this world of, of the AMT regime. And, and just to, to, to give a final thought before we pass it on to Bobby, the comment here, as a res, which is in the middle slide, and as a result, more funds will remain with the high net worth donors. If we if we have wealthy people who are giving the money away and the intention was for them to deplete their resources and pass those resources on to to the, the organizations that they wish to support by disincentivizing philanthropy, what I think will happen and what we will see and I expect to see is that the wealthy will stay wealthy, they'll just give away less dollars, they'll they'll continue to give away money, but slow it down over time. And I I, I question if that um, is a great, I, I don't think it's a great result. I'll put that out there. That certainly would not be what I would call a great result. With that, Bobby, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you. Um, so we're looking at the slide, but I'm just gonna add to your to your comment that you, uh, that you made before. Uh, if a wealthy person is going to be disincentivized to uh, fifty thousand dollars of philanthropy, who wins and who lost and who loses? So yeah, there'll be more tax revenue. The wealthy person is wealthier, right? It's, if 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 it would pay out the fifty thousand dollars and get tax savings, sure, uh, they get tax savings. But by not making the donation, they're wealthier. The only one that loses is is charity, which is society. So this is a weird one. So here we're looking at um, a slide. And we're going to look at it because it's a base of other slides. It's it's what he was talking about for capital gains. And we're just going to quickly look at it that says, if so, if someone has a, a, and we're assuming other income of $400,000, because we're pa so past the exemption levels and all that. If someone has a capital gain personally of $20 million, ta 10 million is taxable. Terrific. So under the normal tax at the highest rate, and we're only looking at federal uh, federal rates now and federal AMT, at the top rate, 33%, they would pay $3.3 million of tax. Under AMT this year, um, the income would be 16 million, uh, a portion of the, of the total capital gain. At the 15% AMT rate this year, the tax would be 2.4. So there would be no AMT. The normal tax is higher than the AMT tax. There would not be any AMT. Under the new provisions, there's two changes, one more, more of the capital gain comes into income. So all 20 million is now AMT income and the tax rate is 20.5%. So now the AMT tax of 4.1 million is higher than the normal tax of 3.3 million. So there's your example uh, in black and white really of the effect of this. And when you says that the effective uh, uh, inclusion rate for capital gains has gone from 50% to 62%, which means more tax. Here we're showing it, uh, the extra AMT. And so in this case, there'll be uh, $767,000 of, of AMT. It's a lot of money. How do you recover it? Well, it may be difficult because you may not have $20 million of capital gains every year and that kind of income. So it may be just a loss of, a loss of tax. 
so, you know, and, and to even increase the absurdity of capital gains tax on the next slide, we see a situation uh, about uh, capital losses. And capital losses, as, as you pointed out, is, will only be usable now in half. Well, for AMT purposes. So normally, and again, if we can go to the uh, to the next slide, uh, if, if normally we have a $20 million capital gain, but we have a $20 million capital loss. So in, 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 in 20, 2022, we have a $20 million loss. In 2023, we have a $20 million gain. Okay, when we're doing our 23 return, we'll show the $20 million gain, but we'll carry forward the capital loss of 20 million, zero taxable income, zero tax, as there should be zero tax. Your losses and your gains are equivalent. You've not made any money, uh, net money, should be zero tax. Now with this rule that says we can only use capital losses to half. So if this were to happen in 2024, in other words, the loss happened in 2022, we're carrying it forward to a gain in 2024. All of a sudden, we have zero taxable income normally, but for AMT income, because we can only use half the capital loss, we're gonna have $10 million of income. At the 20.5% rate, you have a $2,050,000 tax on nothing. There's no net income achieved here. So this is really absurd. Now, the reason why we're, we're starting with capital gains, and we can go to the next slide, is that often big philanthropy occurs as a result of a special event. Um, and something good happens, there's liquidation, real estate is sold, businesses are sold. And that's when foundations are set up, donor advised funds are set up, major gifts to, to charities are done because we've done great, let's return to society. Yeah, we're gonna take advantage of tax. We have a lot of tax to pay. Now's the time to take advantage of the tax savings on the philanthropy. So it all mixes together and traditionally, that big gain, that big liquidation event has been a precursor to making philanthropy. And, and that's, you know, the psychology of it is that I've done great, let me return. Okay. So here we're just taking our same 20 million capital gain. Okay. And we say, which is $10 million taxable normally. And we're making a $5 million cash gift. We're going to look at marketable securities uh, next. A $5 million cash gift. This is our scenario. We've done well, let's give $5 million to society, okay? And we, we have no other income. We're only assuming here a personal tax credit. Why are we assuming nothing else to simplify the example, okay? There, with other things, interest expense and other things, it'll be more complicated, it'll make the AMT worse, but we're simplifying. So let's look at our, our situation here. We have uh, a $10 million taxable capital gain, a $5 million donation, okay? Our normal tax will be a million six, okay? AMT 2023, we, we put in that data, no issues. The AMT calculation is less than 1.6 million, no issues, we're fine. That's the way we are today. So this is our, our, our objective of, of, of returning 5 million to society works well. AMT 2024, our AMT tax will be $3,238,000, okay? And that's not a good thing because all of a sudden, our tax is just about doubled. We have $1,612,000 more. And if we were looking why that is, it's for two reasons. One is we saw on the example with the capital gain is that all of a sudden you have AMT just because of the capital gain. So about half of this AMT arises because of the capital gain. And the other half, about 800 and something thousand dollars, arises because of the gift. And you're having a, an extra cost of making the gift of $800,000. And it's going to be pretty hard to get back this AMT because putting it all together, uh, you know, you, you can start getting it back, the capital gains AMT, that part, but to get it all back is going to be difficult. 
So you probably are going to have an extra $800,000 of tax on the gift. A $5 million gift, let's assume a 50% tax rate, would have cost 50%, right? You'd, you'd save two and a half million of tax. Well, now you're saving two and a half million less $800,000. So now you're it's a $1.7 million of, uh, of tax savings on the $5 million. Okay, we're now up to a cost of gift of 65%, 67%, a 67% uh, cost of gift. So who are we penalizing here? Well, the taxpayer, if that taxpayer says, oh, look at my tax uh, situation here. You know what, I'm going to make, uh, I'm going to bring down my gift to $3 million and that will, you know, make my tax situation a lot better. Okay, so $2 million less goes to society. And that's the issue here. Next slide, please. So the next slide is going to look at the same situation. Except, and it's it's uh, uh, the slide says something wrong. It says five million dollar cash gift. It's actually a um, uh, a marketable security gift. Okay, appreciated security, and so five million dollars of appreciated securities, which is a great gift, right? And the ACB is one million dollars. Terrific! It's a great great stock to choose if you have a twenty percent cost base. That's the one to choose to make your gift. This is terrific. You've made your $20 million capital gain. You're returning to society. Yeah, choose marketable securities as your way of doing it, especially with one with such a low cost base, because we know that that capital gain of $4 million is not going to be taxed. Terrific. Okay. So what happens here when we do the numbers? Normal tax, $953,309. Uh, AMT tax, uh, no issues. Okay. Um, uh, AMT 2024, we have 2,811,000. So we have a million eight hundred and fifty eight thousand dollars of AM uh, of of more of AMT. Okay. Again, if we look how much is the capital gain, maybe seven hundred fifty thousand is because of the capital gain. Now, uh, the, the the balance of million dollars is due to the marketable security gift for two reasons. One, the credit. Of, uh, of two and a half million is only half of that is usable for AMT purposes. And we have to throw in 30% of the gain. The gain is 40, 40, uh, $4 million. 30% of that uh, of that gain, which we're not taxing, a million two is now added to, uh, to income for AMT purposes. So that adds more AMT. So that just shows the effect of this and the, you know, which, which, which is, Yes, if you're going to uh, have a special uh, gain and you're going to return to society, you're you're going to be hit, and that's going to uh, reduce philanthropy. Um, okay, let's go to the uh, next slide. And go to me the security So we just. We just did this. What, what if we did lower numbers? And lower numbers are important because um, one of the uh, big effects of the changes is that there's an exemption for AMT of $173,000. So when you start to go lower numbers, you, you, um, you know, all of a sudden it may not be as bad, okay? Because that's the effect of the $173,000 exemption for AMT. So that takes most people out of the, the conversation. If, if you have, you know, a, a tax return of, of, of 100,000 normally, and you have a $100,000 gain, and you want to give to charity uh, a, a good piece of it, it the effect is, is not as bad for AMT. So let's just look at this example. We have a $2 million capital gain, okay? Uh, um, and... And 1.5 million of security gift, and just to see, you know, in that particular case, um, uh, how this would affect the the AMT here would only be fifty eight thousand um, dollars. So, so here here again in this example, we're we're doing 
2 million of income. We have 1.5 million of security gift. Um, uh, what's the effect here? There's 58,000 at AMT. Okay, so is that a horrible thing? Actually not. Um, yes, I'd rather not have it, but that shouldn't stop someone from making a one and a half million dollar gift, saving tax of 1.2 million on the capital gain here. Um, yeah, your, your cost of gift is gonna, is gonna move forward uh, from perhaps 20% uh, really, or 30% to 40% or 35%, but that shouldn't be enough to stop anyone. So AMT is a factor here. It is a factor. It's gonna make tax a little worse, but it doesn't necessarily mean it will disincentivize people. Uh, in this case, if you have normal income going in every year, you have $58,000 of AMT, you'll probably recover it over the next seven years to bring your cost of giving down to where it would have been before. So not a horrible situation. Uh, let's look at um, uh, let's look at another slide. So we're just showing here um, um, four hundred thousand dollars of other income. You have a one point five million capital gain. We have a five hundred thousand marketable security gift, zero ACB. Okay, so that's a really good gift. Um, um, what is the uh, what is the effect on AMT zero? Sorry. There is a uh, there is a small there is an AMT uh, effect here of one hundred and ten thousand dollars, just to show you. And then if we go backwards and say how much income would it take, not capital gains income, but other income would it take to put you in a zero AMT situation? It would take a million dollars of income. So here, here's the situation. We have 400,000 of other income. We have a capital gain. We're doing a 500,000 marketable security gift. We have $110,000 of, of AMT. Some of it because of the capital gain, a good part of it because of the, the next part of it because of the gift. So again, negative effect here of combining incomes. Next slide. Uh, so I'm just quickly... The, the combination of capital gains and and um, and charity is 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 very important in gift planning. And so here we just show Mrs. A gifts one million dollars of preferred shares of her hope code to charity. The shares are redeemed after the gift. She has a taxable capital gain of five hundred thousand dollars, which is normal, and and she gets a donation receipt of one million dollars. So this is an estate planning gift plan where we're doing it to eliminate a, an asset, preferred shares that Mrs. A owns, which will ultimately be taxable on death. Maybe we're going to get back some dividend refund on here, maybe not. But it's a good gift for someone who's quite senior, can use the donation receipt of a million dollars against the 500,000 taxable capital gain but also against other income. Um, so it's a very good uh, gift. All of a sudden here, we have to look at AMT. Again, when we have capital gains and giving, we have an AMT situation. And when Ali was talking about, uh, you know, leaving Canada, you know, it just hit me right now of, of, of a, a very large gift we took in in the foundation when someone left Canada. And instead of paying the tax on the capital gains, decided to create a, a major uh, a fund. And, and as Ali pointed out, huge AMT situations now, not recoverable because the person is not going to do, uh, do, do tax returns anymore. Um, next slide. We just threw, we just said, um, what, if, what if we were to do uh, dividends as another type of income? So we, we took dividends from a holding company which is called ineligible dividends. And we, we wanted to um, uh, really give the dividends as donations, right? And 
you know, at another time, we may have taken $2 million and done all of it as a, as a, uh, as a donation. Just seeing on these numbers, AMT in 2023, no issues. AMT 2024, $87,172 because of the effect of, of, of dividends for, um, for on, on AMT, which is not pure, and we have our donations. So again, someone just saying, oh, I just want to take the money out of the company, give it, give it to a charity. All of a sudden there's an AMT and, and saying I should have no tax and even less than no tax. All of a sudden now we'll have AMT. So this is problematic, not horrible. 87,000 is not horrible. Okay. Uh, maybe the person can continue uh, in the next seven years getting it back, but there's an effect. Uh, next slide or so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, another aspect of, of income is, is uh, mining flow throughs and mining flow throughs by itself. What is the effect of AMT and mining flow throughs? So we see the, 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 there's not a new effect. We've always had AMT. Okay. Um, and, um, but now with the capital gain inherent in the deal, that's going to have a negative effect on AMT. Your donation is going to have a negative effect on, on AMT. So what's the story there? And, and, and we're used to having rules of thumb on AMT. Well, if you have, you know, to, for every $10 of income you have, you can create a dollar of, of donation. Okay. So that's, and are we looking at rules of thumb now? So I want to sort of explain, we don't have rules of thumb. Um, um, the, the, because particularly because of that $173,000 exemption, it's going to affect people at different levels differently. And that's why you can't have a rule of thumb. So let's assume someone has 500,000 of income and in 2023 has done uh, a mining flow through and uh, created 50,000 of dividend uh, of, of donation, therefore has bought $120,000 of mining flow through and there's no AMT, okay? The person wants 50,000 of donation. It's beautiful, okay? Taking 10% of their income and giving it to charity, beautiful. Uh, puts it in a donor advice fund, passes it out to, to their charities. 2024 comes back and says, I want 50,000 of donations. I want to buy them again, okay? And as a gift planner, one would say, okay, let's look again at our a good series. Well, we know mining flow throughs are a good way of doing it. Let's start with that. And then we'll look at marketable securities afterwards if we need more. Okay, so now we're shown, oh, we have AMT. If we buy the same amount. So you can only buy 35,000 of donation uh, before AMT. Okay, next step is let's look at other taxpayers in the group. Well, maybe the spouse can buy mining flow through and, and get you up to your 50,000 of donations. Okay, maybe it, that's not possible. Okay. Let's look at other taxpayers, your holding company. Now's the time to look at a holding company and say, oh, do I have marketable securities there? Can I use a deduction? That's a great gift out of a marketable security market. That's how I'll make up the $15,000. Uh, my, my cost of giving there could be 20%, not as good as my 5% from the mining flow through, but pretty good. And I've, and I've done the job. Key there is we're looking at another taxpayer who doesn't pay AMT holding company. So that's our planning now. Do we have taxpayers, other taxpayers who are not in AMT yet? The holding company doesn't have AMT. So we're looking there to make the gift for you. Let's assume we don't have AMT. Uh, we don't have a holding company. So now we're back to personal. So we say, let's look at marketable securities. Okay, very good. Great gift. You have your gain, not taxed, but there's going to be AMT on it. If we brought ourselves to a zero AMT level from the purchase of the mining flow through, then creating a donation is going to create AM, AMT. And uh, your cost of, of giving, which may have been if you had a 20% gain and you would have calculated and said, oh, my cost of giving is you know, 40%, that's good, 40%, better than 50%. Well, maybe now, it's going to be 57% because of the AMT. 
Bobby, um, may I may I uh, stop you with that point, if I may? I think uh, we've now got I think 196 questions to be answered the next uh, half an hour. So you know we can talk about mining flow through for a long time. We certainly have lots of data on this, and if I can just uh, if we can just move on to the question time that's been allocated. I think it's probably a good. Uh, uh, um, there are there are lots of people who are asking lots of questions. Is that all right? Are we good with that? Are you done? Is there anything that I cut you off in mid sentence? It wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> it's okay. So it, it just the point is it's complicated, <laughs> and and my. My other point is you might go back to mining flow throughs because of AMT and still see is that better. So it's, yeah. it's going to be complicated to determine what you do. And it's going to require calculations and thought process of where to go and how to do this with AMT and mining flow throughs. It's not simple, as simple as it was the thought process. That's my final point. Thank you so much. Um, lots of questions have been asked. Thank you all three for the for the presentations. All wonderful and brilliant um quick question of, that's being asked um uh, i think we'll 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 take this over to ali and that is the, the question is assume that the, i have appreciated stock which uh, i which i want to donate to charity in the future with a forthcoming forthcoming tax changes should i make the donation this year or next year assuming the stock price remains the same I think it's going to be a pretty obvious answer, but I think it's worth answering uh, because so much of the discussion has been around the donation of marketable securities. Sure, that's a great question, and I'm going to answer it in a few different ways. Um, so I think certainly if you're looking at a situation where, again, you're planning around AMT and you have the option of making a donation in 2023, I would strongly expect that we're going to see a huge push in the philanthropic community to encourage donors, to encourage clients from tax advisors to make those donations in 2023 versus waiting until 2024 when AMT could kick in and cause a different result. Um, I know that I've already been in um, multiple conversations with a number of charities that I work quite closely with, I shouldn't say work with, volunteer with, and, and the comments there is I think that over the summer we should start to see um, a lot of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, you know, material coming out from the charities, uh, advising their donors, by the way, if this is something you were considering, this is the time to do it before the rates change. Um, something that's very important, though, is that even if a donation is made in 2023, unless the donor can fully utilize the donation tax credit in 2023, that donation tax credit will carry forward into 2024. And of course, then we're stuck with the, the, the different rules on how we calculate AMT and the limits on the 50% limit on the donation credit allowance. This would be great for all advisors who have clients who either have um, donation credit carry forwards or who are going to make very large donations in 2023 who can't utilize them. And something we have to remember with and, and Robert, Bobby, you were you were alluding to this when you were talking in your in your um, slides, is that often the very wealthy donors, the wealthy community, the high net worth community, often, not always, but often has some element of control over their compensation, meaning they can turn the tap on or off from a private corporation or otherwise. Not everybody can, but some can. And it's it's going to be that much more important to consider in the compensation planning of the person, even in 2023, for example. Well, wait a minute. You know, when we, when we do the modeling, when we, when we look at to ahead, well, what's the result of this donation going to be? Okay, we'll have some of the donation that gets unused and carry forward. No, what I think we're going to want to see is for in 2023, if those large donations are being made, you may want you may want to have the business owner who has access to the corporation to pull out additional bonus to pull out additional high rate income from the corporation. Maybe it'll work. I mean, there's no end to the permutations and combinations over how we can how we can I don't want to say manipulate in a bad way, but come up with a compensation strategy that either uses up all of the donations in 2023 or minimizes them in the future. One other point I just want to, to, to point there before I move on is that as well in this, you know, in this concept, um, in this concept of making sure that, you know, the business owner who can make sure they have high rate income, I query also the impact that this will have in the investment community. For example, as we know, interest income, and I'm not here to give investment advice at all, interest income fully taxable, gains income not fully taxable, dividends, eligible dividends, 40% taxable, foreign income, uh, you know, fully taxable at, at high rates, depending on the province you're in, but high rates. I also query if as a way to, um, as a way to manage 
our income and make sure that we minimize the overall impact of AMT if we're going to start to see changes in wealth management philosophies to make sure that that the the income that comes out to the individual whether by investment returns or by you know the private corporation business owner if we'll see those changes well to help alleviate that long answer to an easy question <laughs> well, that actually takes us into another question. Thanks, Ali. But another question, I think maybe um, um, you can answer this because I know he he, uh, he authored a, 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 an article called Is Your RSP a Ticking Time Bomb? The question is, what's the best option for a retired person with the highest marginal tax uh, bracket and with annual income um, to recognize more income to uh, with respect to uh, before triggering AMT next year? And also, what can they do with respect to next year? It's not a perfectly written question, but I'm, I'm not. There's no attribution here either. So, you, what is the best option? Do you think for a retired person who's already in the marginal uh, top marginal tax rate, um, looking to uh, to avoid the AMT rules to the extent possible? Uh, to the extent that AMT is going to uh, apply, uh, you know, in either 2023 or more likely in 2024. Um, and you need more additional income that's going to sort of offset the preferred items. One thing that uh, individuals could look to do is to take money out of their RRSP or RIF. And uh, the reason for that is, is that, you know, it is a ticking time bomb in so much as the government's going to get, you know, in most provinces, you know, 53% of your RRSP upon death, or at least the death of the second spouse. And, uh, for that reason, you may want to consider taking it out well, you, where you can shelter it uh, with various products such as flow through shares. And, um, you know, you know, RRSPs are great for young people. They allow for before tax compounding. But the older you get, the worse off an RRSP is. RRSPs do not benefit for the, from the dividend tax credit. RRSPs do not benefit for the 50% inclusion rate. Although... Mm -hmm. Uh, although an RSP is not taxable in the short run, when the monies eventually come out, they're taxed as pension income. So on a capital gain, you're doubling your tax rate, and on a dividend, you're significantly increasing your tax rate. Um, so, uh, you know, considering, uh, you know, collapsing your RRSPs early, I think uh, is an effective strategy that uh, could allow you to uh, mitigate the uh, uh, AMT issues. Thank you. Um, back to Bobby for a moment, because uh, uh, being, being in La Belle Provence, uh, the question is, what's the AMT rule effect for, for Quebec donors and taxpayers, since uh, Quebec has a separate tax system that includes its own AMT calculation? Well, you know, so there is separate rules. And, uh, uh, you know, so first, these are federal proposals. Okay which if adopted by Quebec in the same way, would have a, an equal effect in Quebec, uh, but they have to adopt them and, and often do take federal rules and adopt them. So I don't know the answer. We, we do know that, that if they adopt the same rules and, and, and do the same thing, then it'll have a bad effect. And if they don't adopt the rules, then from, from that point of view, we're okay. So I don't have the answer, but they have to go and make a, a particular, in their budget, they have to go and say, we align with, with the feds on these things, and they might or might not, but they probably will. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple of questions, both related, one out of the resource sector, one out of the philanthrop, for those more interested in the philanthropic side of this seminar, and that is who's doing what to alert government uh, one the question in part is do we do we think these these uh, changes were intentional or just um, or just just unintended consequences um, and then who is um, who is uh, petitioning government uh, with respect to uh, with respect to these uh, changes and alerting um, both the politicians and the bureaucrats of the of the negative impacts that we've talked about this morning uh, this is a jump ball question not directed at anyone anybody and anybody can jump up so um, Oh, Ron, I'll, st I'll start because I believe uh, these rules were 100% intentional. I do not think that there is uh, uh, any unintended consequences. You know, frequently there are unintended consequences. I know when they made the changes to CDA um, and um, redemption of shares, the government was completely unaware 
uh, of the uh, implications uh, that happened in the early 1990s, and they were not until the life insurance uh, um, industry brought them to their attention did they actually understood what uh, what implications had been. Uh, I don't think that that's the case here. I think that this is very much a conscious effort uh, to, to attack, which uh, I find very interesting because the government is introducing the critical minerals uh, credits to you know encourage uh, exploration of critical minerals and you know uh, bring uh, north bring back to North America the meeting between Biden and Trudeau recently dealt with uh, you know critical minerals and, and and making sure we have a North American supply and yet they give it with one hand and take it away with the other because uh, these new AMT rules are going to claw back all of these benefits. Um, the second thing, they want to encourage philanthropic giving uh, by the donation of stock, uh, which has, you know, benefited, you know, huge numbers of charities. And um, now they're again taking away. So I believe these changes are intentional and only a backlash from various communities, particularly the mining community that benefits from flow through shares and from the, uh, from the philanthropic community is going to turn the, uh, change the tide. You know, I just wanted to add, I could have sworn this morning on the morning news, I saw I saw something um, about uh, the Prime Minister in, in, I think he's in South Korea, uh, giving a talk about, uh, you know, the commitment to critical minerals and, and, and in the South Korean Parliament. Maybe I misheard, I don't think so. But it, it, to your point exactly, as it's intentional, but, you know, what they give with one hand, they take away with the other. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I, I did see a question come through, you know, are, are charities aware of these changes? And the answer is, I don't know. I think some are. You know, I definitely think that some are. I think it's going to be very important that there's a, a um, uh, you know, a, a cohesive effort amongst the charitable organizations across the country to make their voices heard, whether through, you know, national organizations um, um, or, you know, associations of charities to make sure that the, the impact, the impact that this will have on uh, their ability to raise funds from high net worth donors. Um, you know, will it impact the monthly donor that gives ten dollars every month? Probably not. Um, but it will absolutely. And there, and and you know, I work with many charities. We rely heavily on those monthly donors. I don't want to minimize the importance of those donors and those dollars. But it it will also absolutely impact the um, the flow of funds and the timing of funds that charities will receive. Yeah. So and and don't, you know, so I, either. Oh, sorry. Go on, Bobby. So I, I agree. So I know like the, the Canadian Association of Gift Planners are planning to uh, write up something to government on this, uh, but it, 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 it did sneak in there. And that's why people and charities aren't well. I mean, a, a, cha a charity uh, did a review of the budget uh, representing all of Canada, Imagine Canada, and they said, well, there was nothing in there directly on, on, on affecting charities. Oh, no, there was, uh, because you just didn't see it. And, and that's, you know, is that sneaky? Type of thing, um, probably. Uh, and if you and if and if you contention that this was done all on purpose and without any, you know, any bad thoughts or anything like that, just we missed it. But they did it sneakily, and and um, and therefore we have to make a little bit of a of a push. Now remember, we don't have draft legislation on this. Oftentimes in budget, it's accompanied with draft legislation with some with some you know hard hard words that says this is how it works they didn't do it they have to come up with draft legislation uh another example of of a of, of, of a charity effect which related to uh being able to give to entities that are not canadian uh charities they also when they came up with their effect did not give draft legislation when they did come oh there was another discussion on it that changed again so there's still room for discussion here um and but we have to get the message to uh, to finance and to the government. And there may be a time when uh, the charitable sector has to organize its friends to go speak to their members of parliament about this, uh, because it will have an effect on charity long term. Right. If I if uh, I may, did I cut you off again? Uh, sorry, I, can I just make one further point? Although I do believe that this was intentional, I believe it was very poorly thought out. Uh, Brian Ernawine, who is now working with KPMG and is not well loved in the uh, Canadian tax community for some of the things he did when he was uh, head of tax policy at the Department of Finance, uh, came out after uh, these rules were announced and said that it was completely asinine and, uh, as Bobby said, absurd that losses would somehow impact AMT. That if you lost 
you know, 10 million in one year and made 10 million the next year, that you could somehow get caught with AMT. So when Brian Ernawine is criticizing the Department of Finance, you know these rules are poorly thought out. Okay, so um, that said, a couple of a couple of points that uh, with respect to critical the the intersection of flow through shares, critical minerals, uh, donations, and finance. You know, the majority of the flow through financings that have occurred this past uh, twelve months since the introduction of that thirty percent tax credit in the uh, twenty twenty two budget was that across the country, approximately three hundred and fifty million dollars of flow through shares were issued. Uh, uh, financing uh, the exploration for lithium, copper, and other critical minerals. By the way, in spite of the fact that gold is 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 around two thousand dollars an ounce, there aren't a lot of folks who are interested in investing in in that space. No matter, it, 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 and would much prefer to invest in in lithium and copper. Of the of that three hundred and fifty million dollars, much of it was done in the format that we developed, and so the result of that. Uh, these new rules would be that the donor who otherwise could have donated $100,000 and has under the next year's AMT rules will only be able to donate $65,000, assuming their income remains the same and assuming the deal metrics don't change from this year to next year, um, which, which, which has a, a direct relationship to the amount of flow through that is issued, which also is down by a third. So if you look at that $350 million that would have otherwise, that was done in the past 12 months, that number for the, for the uh, resource sector is going to be reduced from 350 down to say 225, $230 million based on the same seven or 800 people across the country that funded all of that activity, largely for philanthropic purposes. So uh, I will tell you that, that you know, we do have a full-time government relations person on staff we will be circulating a petition. She's actually in Ottawa yesterday and today, uh, garnering support from uh, from basically from backbenchers to sponsor that petition. She has now got buy-in for that. So we'll ask everyone to come back to us, and we'll we'll reach out to everyone saying there's a petition that's to be signed. We prefer paper over online for just for impact purposes, and you'll be hearing from us again. That said, as well, Prospectors and Developers Association (PDAC) is now. Um, um, more up to speed as a result of our outreach to them. We've actually run the numbers, and I think they're in preparing alongside potentially the TSX um, uh, submissions, uh, uh, also warning government of the impacts on, uh, in part, the, the critical minerals uh, uh, space um, sector that that they've been so successful in, and where they're betting so much of their um, um, of success on. So hopefully, from a political perspective, a politician's perspective, you know, this the AMT rules will limit uh, significantly the um, the the impact of those other rules, as you referred to earlier. And um, and so hopefully, we're we'll, we'll have an audience when we get to them over the next month or two. But stay tuned to help. Um, I don't know if there are many other questions that we need to answer. Is there anybody that wants to add anything as I just review questions? Uh, yes, something that I think that that's important, Ron, and I wouldn't mind addressing. And I've seen it. I've seen it come up in a number of questions that come through here. Um, the question is, well, what about corporations? Are corporations subject to AMT? And I just, I want to, I want to highlight that. I think it's important because I think it, I think it. So okay, I'll stop there. So so uh, corporations do, and it depends on the the various province. There is something called a, you know, a corporation minimum tax. For example, in Ontario, there is a, a CMT that's also always been there. Um, it's, you know, corporation minimum taxes. Um, there's also been capital taxes in the past. Capital taxes, minimum taxes are often for you to even be. Um, sometimes the the basis computed on which the taxes in on which the tax is levied or the applicability if you're even in that regime it's really based on an asset test usually um and it applies to much much larger organizations i'm not suggesting that every province across the country there might be some that have have lower thresholds at which these these different rules kick in but certainly the changes of amt that we're talking to now apply only at the individual level not the corporate level um so that's a whole different regime and um you know whatever was last year is still this year there isn't just a uh, a remarkable change and also those those um certain of those minimum taxes and corporations were again it was a it was a, a tax rate levied against um an asset base 
Um, and it, or if it was an income test, it's certainly against a much, much higher threshold where perhaps you might need 50 million um, of assets plus um, uh, or a hundred million dollars in revenue. I'm just think, thinking of some of the Ontario tests. Um, so that's that's really, I would say, perhaps outside of the scope of the donor world of the even with, you know, the high net worth donor. Um, yes, they may have assets that hit at that level, but, you know, they they. I'll just I'll, maybe I'll stop there before I get too technical. But I think a really important point, and this came up throughout, it was weaved throughout the discussion today, um, in the same way that I I do think it would be extremely tricky to try to put together, you know, basic rules of thumb or even a calculator. I, it probably can be done. I'll say that there's so much nuance. There's so much nuance to these rules. Um, and there's also so much that gets factored in. And when high net worth uh, donors are making donations, the planners, in order to really do their job, they should be already, which is something they should be doing in the past and they should be doing now and in the future, stepping back. And I talked about it before, the where are you making the donation from? It may not make sense for a certain fact situation for a donor to make that donation as an individual. Perhaps they should make that donation from an active business corporation, or perhaps they should make that donation from a, a passive investment business, whether that dovetails with flow through shares or not. You know, certain types of certain types of credits and and um, you know expenditure rebates are are best captured in certain types of vehicles. And um, so whether it's a whether it's I'll call it like a plain vanilla donation or a little bit more of an exotic donation. Absolutely, that question of taking a step back, evaluating all of the alternatives. This is something that you know we do do in practice to make sure that the client is getting their biggest bang for their buck in terms of their donation dollars. Because everyone's a winner, right? Everyone's a winner. There'll be more for the donor, more for the charity, more for everybody. Um, and I definitely think that there will be situations where, if you look at a, a client's fact pattern and realize, oh my goodness, if you do it like this, we're going to end up in the minimum tax world, and it would make more sense to make that donation corporately. It may make sense, the last thing I'll say is it might make sense for someone who has, um, you know, though if they have a portfolio of massive appreciated securities in their personal name, would it make sense for them to roll those shares into a corporation and make the donation out of the corporation? It might. Um, I'd have to run all the numbers just to make sure, but that might be a very viable alternative for that individual. One thing that makes me a little bit nervous with corporations it's very easy to stuff assets into the corporation very difficult to take out the assets on a on a tax efficient basis unless you're planning on selling it so i certainly wouldn't suggest that everybody run after this uh call and tell everybody to stick their assets into a corporation but that might be um that might be one of the possible solutions to this challenge um so i thought that that was a, a good point to address ron uh, thank you, Ali. Maybe I'll maybe I'll put it back to you for a moment, seeing as he worked at the CRA and mentioned Brian Ernawine's name. And that is, do you see AMT coming for the CCPC in terms of income, not in terms of asset base? Do you think CCPCs will will be subject to AMT at some time in the future uh, uh, under this government? Uh, I don't believe so. I think that uh, they've got a lot of other fish to fry. Um, I also think uh, we're you know, heading into an election. I don't think that that's probably something that's on the radar. Um, you know, the government, I think, has other uh, things that they're going to start looking at, uh, particularly the taxation uh, of income within private corporations, the surplus stripping, uh, things like that. So I, I do I don't think that that's something that's on the radar screen. But I, there, there's very few leaks that ever come out of the Department of Finance. So nobody has any insight in this area. Okay, thank you. I think generally I'm looking, there's quite a lot of repetition in the questions, but I think currently I think any of the other questions can be answered in writing. I don't know if anybody has any last comments, but even though we've uh, we've slotted it to 1130, I think we're pretty well done the topic for the moment and uh, very I just, I just, and usually just insightful. Add, Bobby, you want the last just, word? Just adding, you know, the question of should I prepay donations this year rather than next year? It's a good question, but there may be other aspects that you'll also look at, and that if you have capital gains associated with that, yes, you might even push a capital gain, a personal capital gain, into 2023, which is exactly opposite of what we usually do. We usually defer the realization of income, but you may actually put a, a personal huge capital gain into 2023 rather than waiting to 2024 and do the philanthropy in 2023. But some of the thinking will be, 
I'm going to have a big personal capital gain. Maybe I'm going to roll the asset into a company and, 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 and take the gain in a company and do the philanthropy from the company will be some of the thinking that will go on. The, uh, I think, sorry, go on. I was going to say, oh, Bobby, when you made that comment, a little light bulb went off in my head. I said, oh, I think we're going to be in for a busy summer as planners because you're, you're, you're absolutely right. This is one of those times where, you know, back to what was presented at the beginning about, you know, this backdoor change in the inclusion rate, which is real, um, you know, which is real. Again, it's AMT. You got to consider if you can if you can recover it back. But this might be one of those times where you do want to prepay tax, pull it in earlier than you otherwise would have to. As you mentioned, there's ways to do it. Um, you know, there's ways to do it in our in our tax system that are are quite vanilla. I'll say if I can do that um, to make sure that we don't fall into those rules. Oi, interesting. The bottom, I think so. The, the bottom line from Ali is oi. I think that I think you have to say that as you exhale. By the way, Ali. Um, so thank you all. Uh, just maybe one last comment as we talk about these things, and that is the value of uh, the capital dividend account at the CCPC level has just gone up significantly. So whether you're, and the capital dividend account is just the free half of the capital gain for those who, you know, that sounds familiar, but what is it? So under integration, if I buy a share for a dollar and sell it for 101, I've got $100 of capital gain, and half of it we know currently is free. Uh, if a corporation does the same thing, that X, that, that, $50 of free money has to be reflected in somewhere on the books for the shareholders. That's called CDA or capital dividend account. That allows you to write a, a check out of the company tax-free. It's the free half of the capital gain. Um, it has, you, you, can, you can run the number and say, this is the value of that CDA account. I will tell you that the emotional value of, of getting a tax-free distribution out of a company is much higher than the actual real value. It seems like everybody feels great about CDA, uh, and it's it's largely what I think the insurance industry also is, has built its business on, that corporations, you know, hopefully waiting for you to die, um, the, the corporation will benefit and it comes up through the capital dividend account. So lots of, to, lot, lots of puzzle pieces to assemble, not exactly sure how all the pieces are going to come together. Um, Ali's going to be busy doing planning this summer. Uh, we're going to be busy doing lobbying this summer. We are registered lobbyists now. Very exciting stuff. Uh, so stay tuned. Um, I, I, I said at the outset before this meeting, uh, before the before the seminar started, that I would res resist saying this, but I can't help myself. Bobby knows that better than anyone. Um, so if, if you go into the, the PearQ website lobby, we are selling pitchforks and axe handles for those who want to join the mob and, and come to Ottawa. Uh, I'll be renting 18 wheelers as well, I think. Anyway, on that silly note, uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you, uh, Miera and Nusha for setting all this up. Thank you, Laura, for putting it all together. Um, questions will be answered. Uh, video links will be provided. Um, I hope that uh, it was as instructional for you as, as it was uh, for us in the, and that, uh, that you both uh, learned a lot and also had fun uh, learning this in spite of the, uh, the, uh, the subject matter uh, but generally, I think for everyone, call your local politicians, speak to your organizations, um, speak to your the law, the large accounting and law firms. What are you doing to alert government that this is just wrong? The idea that there should be alternate minimum tax when giving away money uh, is just silly. Mm -hmm.